Speaking of density, let's take a quick look at hydro turbines before we close up this lecture. Water is around a thousand times as dense as air, so hydro turbines needn't be as physically massive as wind turbines. This being said, hydro turbines work slightly different than wind turbines. Yes, there's a flow of matter through them, however, they additionally work using a pressure differential from the top of the reservoir to the outlet. One method of determining input power to a hydropower turbine demonstrates in power as density in kilograms per meter cubed times gravitational acceleration in meters per second squared times head, the distance from the top of the reservoir to the outlet in meters times a flow rate in cubic meters per second. This being said, finding these quantities in usable format is somewhat difficult because most dams in the US were built using US customer units and may necessitate intermediate unit conversions. For example, consider a 52 megawatt rated hydro turbine with a 74 foot differential from the top of the reservoir to the outlet running at the rate of capacity with a flow rate of 12,250 cubic feet per second. Water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Acceleration of gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. We need to put head and flow rate in usable units of meters and cubic meters per second. Let's ask the internet. ConvertUnits.com says 74 feet is roughly equivalent to 22.6 meters and 12,250 cubic feet per second is roughly equivalent to 346.9 cubic meters per second. Substituting these values into the hydropower equation yields an input of roughly 76.9 megawatts. Given this turbine produces 52 megawatts of usable electrical power output when supplied roughly 76.9 megawatts of hydropower input, this represents an efficiency of roughly 71.8% which is actually pretty poor, considering a modern Kaplan turbine can reach an efficiency approaching 90%. This being said, 71.8% efficiency is not bad, considering the turbine I modeled this data on was installed in 1937, back when children used to ride donkeys to their jobs in coal mines. As with wind turbines, the input power to a hydropower turbine is dependent upon these input properties. Turbines with more differential between the top of the reservoir and the outlet, i.e. higher head, and those turbines with larger draft tubes can accommodate higher flow rates and thus experience more input power. Now that we've got an understanding of those properties that influence input power to wind hydro turbines, let's compare and contrast the two. You recall wind turbines operate inside a range of wind speeds and directions and need to actively pitch their blades and yaw to follow the wind, which is uncontrolled and uncontrollable. In short, a wind turbine needs to chase the wind like a cat does a laser pointer. Hydropower turbines are different in that rivers aren't known to frequently switch direction, nor does flow rate normally spike up and down. This means hydropower turbines essentially operate by maintaining constant input from an available resource. The management of flow rate is largely performed by opening and closing what are known as wicket gates, using a bull ring and two hydraulic cylinders. If one cylinder extends and the other retracts, they turn the bull ring such that the wicket gates open like Venetian blinds and allow more water in. Conversely, as one cylinder retracts and the other extends, the bullring rotates in the opposite direction such that the wicket gates close and allow less water in. In addition to modulating the flow rate using the wicket gates, a Kaplan turbine can additionally pitch the blades, as do wind turbines, to capture more or less of the incoming flow. If you think about it, the primary responsibility of a hydropower turbine control system is not to respond to wildly changing input, as would a wind turbine, but rather keep input inside a defined range that maximizes efficiency. The logical extension of this different means of control has some pretty important consequences to the methods one uses to generate power from wind versus the method one uses to generate power from water. Given a hydro turbine has the luxury of maintaining a steady flow of a stockpiled and available renewable resource, most large-scale hydro turbines, not all, are synchronous generators that run at a constant speed. Wind turbines, in contrast, need to respond to often wildly changing wind speeds and directions and are more suited towards variable speed generation schemes like comparatively simple induction generators or slightly more complicated doubly fed induction generators with partial conversion. Viewers will recall we discussed synchronous, induction, and doubly fed induction generation in great detail in the Motors and Generators playlist, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you really, really had to use a wind turbine to generate synchronously, Often the only way to do so might be through what's known as full conversion, where the wind turbine runs at whatever speed suitable for the conditions and the generator outputs wild three-phase AC. That is three-phase AC without regard to voltage magnitude, frequency, phase shift, or phase sequence, 
and this wild three-phase AC is entirely rectified to DC and then inverted to grid-compliant three-phase AC with a proper magnitude, frequency, sequence, and phase shift suitable for export by a power electronics device known as an inverter. We'll take a look at some of the power electronics devices that make this possible in greater detail in later lectures. All right, before we wrap this lecture up, I need to fulfill the promise I made at the beginning and authoritatively answer two of the three most common questions I'm asked about wind turbines, notably why they so big, why they so tall, and why they painted white. Why they so big? The power formula demonstrates that a larger surface area intercepts more wind. Turbines favoring low wind regions tend to have longer blades, larger diameter rotors. Why they so tall? The wind power input formula demonstrates that at higher wind speeds yield substantially more input. Horizontal axis wind turbine generators place the rotor on a tower well above the slow moving air at the surface and immerses it inside a region of unobstructed flow. At the surface there exists wind shear, which is a change in wind speed and direction over a short distance, and turbulence, which is a chaotic unstable flow. Getting out of this disturbed region is perhaps the horizontal axis wind turbine generator's single most important advantage over vertical axis wind turbine generators, which place the generator at the base and spin vertically. Although freed from the necessity of yawing to track the wind and climbing during maintenance, vertical axis wind turbine generators simply don't work well because they are constantly beset with poor wind conditions at the surface. As a general rule, an object of height h disturbs a hemispherical region of air 20h in diameter and 2h in height. You note this includes a region of 2h in front of the object as air piles up in front of the obstruction and slows down. Given wind speed's substantial contribution to wind power input, it makes sense to maximize this contribution and get out of the disturbed region and into space with maximum wind speed. Before I address the final question, I should note that although wind speed is the single most influential factor to determine instantaneous power output for a turbine, I'll have you know that far more importance needs to be placed on average wind speed rather than some peak wind speed for a particular location. Wind turbines, after all, are in the business of making energy, and energy is power times time. This means a turbine installed in a low wind environment that regularly experiences low wind on a nearly continuous basis. Again, even if it's a low end of the operational range of a particular turbine, it might actually produce more energy than would a single larger, more powerful turbine operated at the rated speed only on occasion. I'm of course referring to capacity factor, which is the percent turbine runs at capacity versus sitting idle waiting for something to happen. For this reason, there's often a lengthy wind speed data collection and analysis period prior to installing a turbine to see if it's worth the expense of doing so. Lastly, why they painted white? I don't know, maybe there was a sale on white? I suspect this has something to keep visual disturbance to a minimum and white might blend into the sky better at distance than other colors. Personally, I think it'd be super cool if every turbine was tagged like Patrick Vogel's 2025 animation whole turbine, but hey, that's just me. I'll put a link to Patrick's video in the information section below. Check it out, because it's pretty cool. All right, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture discussed wind and water power and discussed those properties like density, area, speed, head, and flow rate that influence it. Additionally, we examined basic control mechanisms and generation methods used by wind and hydro turbines to manage power output. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.